Okay, good afternoon. In just a minute here, I'll have each of the people on the panel introduce yourselves. Uh, you can say how many children you have, uh, if you know approximately how many people there are that come to your church, uh, you can mention that and where you're from. As far as you that are listening in, we uh, look forward to your questions here. So, uh, Brother Steve Fisher, are you back here somewhere? Okay. So, if you could get these uh, cards that are out on the table outside the door, have them ready. If you have a question you'd like to submit, uh, raise your hand, get a hold of Steve's attention, and he'll bring them up to us then uh, that we can work on here at the end if we have time, which hopefully we will. I'm Ernest Eby from State College, Pennsylvania. We have nine families that uh, moved in there to be a part of the church and about half a dozen singles. And we've been going for about eight years. Kevin? Kevin Breckbill? You guys hear me? Okay. Didn't, I didn't think so. Kevin Breckbill from Chambersburg Christian Fellowship. Uh, we have eight children and... Um, 85, 90 people go to our church. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrew Kurtz. My wife, Roxanne, and I have seven children, five of which are here, two of which had other commitments but wish they were here. And uh, we are from Granby, Massachusetts, where we live. We uh, serve the, the greater Springfield area, so we're in the western part of the state of Massachusetts. And uh, there are seven families at the fellowship and uh, a few singles. Good afternoon. I'm Dwight Nisley, and our family lives in New York City in Brooklyn, and my entire family is here. Grateful to have them here. Our entire family consists of three children. We started um, our marriage a little later than many people do. Uh, when I was 38 and my wife was 33, so our window of, of family was quite small, and we praise God for three healthy children, and there are all three here. I went to uh, Brooklyn, to New York in 1997 when the church plant was already about 10 years old and helped start a school at that point and have been there ever since. Uh, and so in some ways, I don't know if I qualify as a church planter, um, but for some reason they asked me to join this, this panel. Okay, thank you. And uh, our church is Followers of Jesus, and I'm married and have two daughters, one of which is here. I've been involved with the Church Planners Forum now for about eight years. We've probably interacted with somewhere around a dozen and a half uh, church plants during those eight years, and many of them have really struggled. And the number one struggle we've had is teamwork partnering together as teams, working together. And so we didn't launch these churches. This is just churches that are represented there at our, our annual gatherings. Uh, some folded up, uh, some nearly folded up, some are going for their second life, I guess, or their third life. And uh, so this is a very important topic. It's easy to find people who are excited about Jesus and excited about uh, winning souls and so forth. But boy, you've got to do this with other folks and work together, then that takes it to a whole new level. So oftentimes people come together and they think, well, certainly if this person's passionate about the Lord and he's passionate about souls, certainly this is somebody that's going to be mature and we're going to be on the same page and work well together and then find out later that, oh, we should have discussed some things here or maybe there was more maturity needed here than what we had when we started so the uh, first question we're going to discuss today came in just after this last topic, and it says, please expound on the concept of preferring your brother. So since Kevin was the one that mentioned that, we'll let him get started, and then the rest of you can comment on that as you like. I'd like, I'd like to start with really a practical thing. I'll let someone else take it. <laughs> yeah, so... Preferring your brother is not an easy thing. I think it's one of the core things of Christianity. Um, it's a, it becomes a way of life. Like it's it's down to 
letting someone else talk first. It's down to letting their ideas actually come to the table and take, and take root and not yours, not pursuing your agendas. It's, it's, a, it's a deep thing that, that has to be developed in your character is what I think of when I think of preferring my brother. Um, and then out of that, you know, it's kind of like this, when you think of the Anabaptist world, one thing that they're strong on is they do know how to submit to one another in a broad sense. That's why when Christian, Christian aid ministries come together and they go to build something, their ability to submit to one another, they can turn something around in very practical ways. And the misconception about not preferring your brother is kind of the concept of, of not submitting. When you learn to submit, it actually, you get more traction faster and, and, and you can actually get things done at a greater speed and a greater confidence. Um, and so that's why I think it's critical that we learn to prefer one another on a, on a local level. We can do that when we go to camp, but can we do that in a home in our own congregation? And then we can get traction. We need to understand that upside down kingdom concept. So that's my comment to that. Okay, thank you. So one of the common buzzwords in society today is narcissism. So you don't have to read many articles or listen to, to many YouTube channels or whatever it might be, and you're gonna come across the word narcissism, right? And the scripture has a, a term for that, and it's selfishness. Narcissism is simply selfishness. And um, it's a, it's a self-focus. And I agree with what, uh, in, a, in a very practical sense, with what Kevin said, that we can give ourselves like very simple tests, like how, how much do I prefer others above myself? And one simple test is, who is the subject of, of my conversation? So I think we probably all have had conversations with people where the conversation was all about them, right? It was all about them. And you ever go away from a conversation and realize that they don't know anything about you, but you know everything about them, right? It was a very one-sided conversation. Now, unfortunately, we probably all have had it the other way, where we've talked about ourselves and, and we go away realizing that we really, really don't know much about the other person, all right? That's a, simple, that's a simple test that we can give ourselves, like how much do I prefer other people above, above myself? Second thing is, um, I think is just learning to value other people, or part of this is simply learning to value other people. So when, when Jesus was uh, giving this teaching there in uh, Luke, um, drawing a blank on the, on the uh, reference now, the, where they asked the question is who's, who is greatest in the kingdom of God? And he said, the prince of the Gentiles do it this way, but among you it should not be so, you should do it this way. Um, Jesus then, immediately following that teaching, asked this question, he said, who's greater? He that sits at the table or he that serves? And obviously, the, the obvious answer to that question is, the ones that sit at the table are greater. But Jesus says, I am among you as one that serves. So Jesus just created a value proposition there for everyone to Jesus himself valued others greater than himself. So I think, uh, I think if we do those two things, we learn to prefer others in, in conversation, learn to value others, we'll be well on our way to uh, preferring others. I think one of the unique things about God's design, I'm not sure, is my speaker on? There we are. I think one of the unique things about God's design is the very first institution he designed was the family. And perhaps our greatest challenge to preferring one another can be in our families. And it's amazing, it's been said that we are nicest to people outside of our family. But I think in preferring one another, God gives us the opportunity to start with our own families. Uh, it's a challenge to me. Um, I think sometimes it's easy as a father, for instance, to think that um, our voice and our word should be heard above everyone else's. But to what extent does our youngest child uh, feel like I prefer them over myself? Um, and perhaps as we ask God at that first level of family uh, to develop the preferring one another, uh, it's our first and maybe best 
place to develop that kingdom value. I think beyond that, to the degree maybe that we are able to do it on that level, we can then look at other team members and other cultures and apply it there. Okay, thank you. Helpful thoughts. All right, so we're going to go into uh, th three different realms here and talk about those, and then we'll have some random questions maybe at the end related to this topic. So the first one is talking about calling. So there may be some people on a team have general interest in helping people spiritually. Others on the team may have specific interest in reaching Muslims, Jews, middle-class families, low-income neighborhoods, Amish, Mennonites, kingdom seekers, etc. And so you have people coming together, but they may have a particular group that they're interested in targeting, and maybe they don't even realize that before they get together, or maybe they do, but it's something that uh, should be talked about. So people have different callings. Some people have a more general calling. Some people feel like they have a more specific calling. How can callings contribute to good team relationships, and how can they hinder good working relationships? And maybe we'll start with Dwight. Well, I think one of the good gifts God has given us is a sense of calling. Um, and I think callings provide focus. They provide a clarity of purpose. They give us a sense of direction. And they allow us to go forward in a way that we of our own um, efforts and wisdom wouldn't be able to have that focus or clarity. And so I believe God does provide that calling. It's interesting, the Apostle Paul would often start out his epistles with his calling. And it seemed like that directed and focused and drove um, his letters and his life. Yeah, I think um, callings are something that, that do need to be openly discussed. I heard of at least uh, one church plant where there was um, conflict over callings. The one family felt like the calling was to this certain uh, group uh, to the exclusion of anything else. And the other family involved had, had a broader sense of, of uh, interest and calling to, to serve a greater demographic. And it, it actually did, did cause conflict. So having the conversations about what our callings are, I think are important in the church plant uh, team forming stage. Early on, those things need to be known and understood. At the same time, I don't think the, the callings all have to be identical. I think they, they should be diverse, as Kevin was talking about, and like Dwight, what you, what you mentioned. Obviously, they have to be somewhat logical in a sense. Like if you are interested in reaching the, the unsaved Amish, you're not going to move to Hartford, Connecticut, right? Because they aren't there. But if you uh, want to reach that demographic, then you're going to uh, stay or be in, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, for example. So obviously, citing yourself where your calling is, I think, is a, is a logical uh, step. But then families involved in a church plant blessing each other in those callings, I think, are, are important. I don't think these callings are contradictory uh, or, or held in tension. Rather, they should be complementary. Even though they may create a little bit of tension or held in tension, uh, there's a lot of things about church life that is held in tension, and, and that's, that's part of the beauty. Let's keep the mics up. Go ahead. Do you want to talk on this? I don't have a lot to say on it. Um, I guess the thing that I have seen over the years is sometimes callings, people can use that as an excuse to be really self-centered. And I think it, that's what brings the division, and then they, they cloak it under the word calling. Um, so I think that has to be deciphered through when you are have this issue at hand. So that's my thought to it. Mm -hmm. Anything else? 
Yeah, I think on the kind of the negative side about how calling can bring conflict rather than unity. Um, I think sometimes we can look at callings in terms of superior and inferior callings and it can develop into a rating system of value. I don't think that's God's intention or design. Uh, I think that can then create kind of a competition also perhaps because of trying to rate which calling should receive greater preference or funding or, or focus or value. Um, I think it can sometimes create a disengagement uh, whenever we think it's not our primary calling, when maybe God would want us actively involved. Okay, thank you. Moving into the second category here, uh, screening. Should a team screen those who want to join the team? And another question right with that, what are some good questions that team members should ask each other before committing themselves to each other? Maybe Andrew, do you want to get started there? Sure. So yes, absolutely. There needs to be a screening process, I think, um, for families and for a church to work together well, there has to be at least some level of, of compatibility. And the screening is part of that, that process. So taking the second part, like what, what are some of those screenings that, that should be discussed? I have just a few here. So vision would be one. What is your overall vision for the church, for your family, for your life? Calling, as we were just talking about, I think callings would be an important discussion to, to have. And uh, doctrine, having a doctrinal discussions to make sure there's a doctrinal similarity. And uh, I think another one would be prior church experience. I think prior church experience uh, molds and shapes us and forms us in, in a way that a few other things do. I sometimes wish I could have a chat with Jesus because somehow he developed the first maybe church planting team with the kind of diversity that would scare me. Uh, you have the tax collector and the zealot. Uh, wow, I, that just seems like asking for trouble. Um, and yet I believe Jesus was very intentional in his um, first team and someday I would like to look through the Gospels and look, try to look at um, all the conflicts that his team encountered and how Jesus responded to each conflict. One was already mentioned here when there was a desire to be at the chief positions within the kingdom and his response. Once was when his team thought that children weren't really an essential part of their work in ministry, and Jesus said, suffer the little children to come to me, because actually of such is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, it would be interesting to really take a look throughout all the Gospels, I think, and see what did Jesus do with the conflicts of his team. But I think one of the things that is really critical to ask is, what hurts do you come with and how thoroughly have those hurts been resolved and what are you doing to resolve those hurts because unresolved hurts of the past have a way of walking with us into the present and even especially in cross-cultural uh, settings bringing responses and triggers that can be really hurtful to pre-believers or believers and so um, questions about hurts and conflicts, how they have been, uh, what they have been, to what degree they've been resolved, I think are important. Wait, you stole my thunder on that one. So uh, my thought was very similar. Uh, what's your conflict resolution, resolution history? Like how have you been able to work through conflicts? Because if we, if you, if you don't know how to work through conflicts, you're going to be the worst person on the team. And uh, to me, that's one of the most important aspects. And my other thing I was going to is uh, how easily are you offended? 
um, I think there needs to be a development with that within us. And if, if we get offended easy, you're not going to work well on a team. So that's my two thoughts. So sometimes people have asked me something in relation to teams, what advice I would have, and I tell them to keep their ideals high and their expectations low. But otherwise, you're, if you uh, keep both of them high, you're going to be very disappointed at some point. If you keep both of them low, you're never going to shoot for anything. You're going to be uh, satisfied with something very mediocre. So keep your ideals high and your expectations low. Paul and the, uh, sorry, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas had a very sharp contention, the Bible tells us, over screening. Uh, one thought Mark was qualified, and the other thought Mark was not qualified. And this disagreement became so heated that it split the team, and they went separate directions. And from what we know, uh, they never worked together again on the same team. So sometimes I like to ask teams, what options did Barnabas and Paul have other than the one that they chose or the one that they simply defaulted to? So I'm going to let uh, these brothers speak to some options that uh, they or others could have besides just uh, splitting up and heading separate directions. I'm not sure what the best alternative should be. It seems to me like the classic struggle of the giftings of grace and truth. Um, there's times when I'm kind of disappointed in Paul because uh, I'm not sure that Paul would have even been in a position to lead a team if it wouldn't have been for Barnabas. Uh, Paul was that bridge. Paul was that connection with the disciples who didn't trust Paul. And he made that bridge available for ministry for Paul. And it seems he must have almost forgotten that now in terms of providing, extending some grace to one who, who failed. Um, but the third alternative, I'm not sure how to respond to. Yeah, it's a really good question, and I wasn't sure how to respond to it. To either, you can give some idealistic platitudes like, well, they should have presented it to the whole body for discussion. They should have talked it through and all that type of thing, and maybe they did. But at the end of the day, it is interesting to note one thing, and that is that uh, if you look at Paul's first missionary journey, he went to Cyprus in that journey, and Paul never went to Cyprus again. Uh, because after the Paul and uh, Barnabas controversy, Barnabas went to Cyprus. And Cyprus was the, the apostle to, uh, to Cyprus. So it looks to me like, like Paul at least honored and respected uh, Barnabas' ministry. So if there comes a need to part ways, you can at least respect the other person and not set up a dealership in his town. <laughs> My only comment is if we do end up parting ways to learn to be, not to be critical of the other person. I think that's the one lesson I think we can learn here. Um, I think it's really easy to find ourselves critical if someone doesn't come or go with us. And I think that's not a good representation of Christ. So earlier today, uh, Brother Barry had mentioned that you know, when he went to Haiti, he had this idea that I am better than these people that I'm reaching. And it took a long time for him to work on that and get that out of his system. And I think that the, um, when it comes to sharp contentions with other people with whom we disagree, and, and like Kevin mentioned, you know, looking down on them or despising them, uh, that, that's the kinds of things that we can sense in our own heart. How am I feeling toward this other person? Is this really a different calling? Is this really a different vision? 
or is this something in my heart that uh, needs some, some uh, work of the Holy Spirit? So yeah, there's the platitudes, what they could have done. Uh, one thing to just simply recognize, if you, if you feel the contention becoming sharp, uh, to recognize that this is a, a thing that will happen in team life. As you start working with a team, don't uh, be surprised if this comes along. And to work on it early on before it gets to the point where there's no way that you can uh, uh, work together with the other person. Uh, there are some times whenever um, two people or more get together to work on a team and one of them does change. Uh, either they come up with a new philosophy, a new doctrine, something that they did not come into the relationship with. And so I would say that's one situation where obviously there may, be, may need to be a parting of ways um, if, if they were agreed on something and then sometime later one of them decides he doesn't believe that anymore, then there may need to be a shift and uh, parting of ways. Anything else any of you want to say on this one? Okay. Uh, walking together. Uh, different writers and speakers have identified four different stages that happen in many relationships. This could be in a marriage, it could be in a church planning team, or even in the workplace. So the first stage is the forming stage. It's the honeymoon stage, the superficial stage, the pretense stage. And this is the stage where we often overlook things in others and try to make the relationship as smooth as possible. And then the second stage is the, was sometimes called the storming stage or the disagreement, the conflict. And it's like, oh, where'd that come from? I thought we were uh, having a good relationship here. Uh, the third stage then is the norming stage. This is when team members learn to submit, surrender, prefer each other, and uh, they get past the conflict stage. And I might just mention there that most relationships in the world just go back and forth between level one and level two, between superficial and conflict. But uh, the goal is to move past that into a place of preferring each other and, and surrendering and submitting to each other. And then the fourth stage is when you've, got, you've moved through that stage to where you can really be productive as a team. You're now working together, you've been through the hard things, and now you're ready to uh, work together and bless the kingdom of God as a group, as a team. So the question for you as a panel, in your experience or as, as you've observed others, what are some things that can bring conflict in a church or team. So I already mentioned one, that of bringing in, of a person changing partway through and not standing for the same things they did before, but what are some others? One that I've observed is the speed of which things are accomplished. Uh, you always have your type A personalities that want to make it happen yesterday then you have the methodical, steady people that maybe actually get, might get more done, and they have a method to their way forward, and uh, I've seen that cause a fair amount of frustration. So there is a way to work with it, um, getting it out on the table, communicating it, and uh, I think giving, giving a clear picture of what that process of moving, moving forward is and looks like helps both sides, and I think it's really, really important. Good. Andrew? Yes, yeah, some, some observations of things that, that have caused conflict or moved a, a fellowship or a church plant from that forming stage to the, the storming stage are things like, uh, like you had mentioned, personal trauma, uh, unhealed wounds from the past that, uh, that get triggered by the, the realities of life. So in the, in the forming stage, the focus is on all the things that we agree on, but in the storming stage, the focus becomes all the things we disagree on. And, and that's where the, where the tension then comes. Another one is, is chronic health issues. And as, if, there is, if there is a family that has um, chronic health issues, severe chronic health issues, um, they can they can be a burden to the, the fellowship, to the work of the fellowship, 
but they're a necessary uh, part, there it is. And, um, but knowing some of that going into a situation is good because not only are they unable to carry their own weight, um, they have to have some weight carried for them. And so I've seen that be a difficult thing. I think one of the <clears throat> big challenges when conflict comes is difference. And it can be on so many fronts. It, and I think maybe the biggest problem is when those differences, there's not a platform to openly discuss that. Maybe even a perception that difference is innately wrong and, and the discussion of it will only bring conflict. I think the reality is not discussing it will bring even deeper and more destructive uh, conflict. But some of the differences that I thought about um, are the differences in giftings and personalities. Somehow we, the lens that we tend to look at it is our own giftings and personality. And somehow that seems like the best set of lenses so easily. And yet when you've got so many different lenses uh, doing the same thing, that can really create a clash. Um, differences in the use of money and even in your own upbringing as to uh, how a, a good Christian should manage their money, uh, that bleeds into an organization. And that can quickly create a tension. Money can so quickly create tension. Uh, differing priorities can really create tension. But I think there can also be the thing of jealousy, and jealousy in other people's giftings, uh, jealousy in other people's assets. Maybe they have a nicer house or a nicer car or a nicer family or a nicer part of the community that you're focusing on. There's jealousy can just so quickly bind up the heart and create conflict. I think there can also be the difference of backgrounds, and each of us look through the filter of our background, and it really colors sometimes our ability to, to consider and to value the backgrounds of others. Okay, those are all good. So with backgrounds, it can be wanting to be like your background, or it could be reacting to your background. Either one can uh, cause problems. On money, it uh, has to do with spending, how you spend your money, but also how, how much you give. And in a small team, uh, there's, you, you need some money, and uh, that can cause uh, some issues if one person's expecting a certain amount of money to be given and another person has a, a different expectation. It's more than you thought of. More things that uh, can cause conflict. I was also thinking about a selective use of scripture, and I don't know if we can totally get past that. <laughs> but um, in worship, you're going to have some who are going to notice the verse, for instance, that says, be still and know that I am God. And that seems to be the driving verse. Others are going to uh, say, but the Bible says, Clap your hands, all you people. Shout for joy with the voice of triumph. The reality is that the Bible says both. But sometimes all of us may struggle more with a selective use of Scripture than we realize. But through that particular verse, we see the other person maybe as less spiritual or less safe within our worship experience. And then there's the thing of differences in personalities. One difference in personality could be the be still versus the clapping. Uh, there could be a lot of differences in personalities. So you have people that see everything as black and white, and then you have people that can just kind of go with the flow and, and do whatever. And somebody has noticed that if your team has too many people with the black and white, it's going to struggle a lot more uh, just because of, you know, it has to be this way. Anything else? Okay, if you have more questions back there, raise your hand. Steve will try to pick up your card and bring it up here. So if anybody has a question you'd like to hear us talk about.
Tim again. Yeah. While we're waiting, um, the thought that I did have is, I think if you want to be successful in life, one of the things you need to learn is to be able to work with a team because if you think you can accomplish a lot by yourself, maybe, probably not. But if I take a team to where you're going of face say five guys, I can get 10 times more accomplished. And that's the power behind it. It not only multiplies by the number of men there, it compounds. And that's the power of a team. So it's really, really quick, cr critical to do that. And I think that happens in a church life as well. Okay, thank you. Next question, what is some practical advice for how a team can spend less time in the storming stage and move more quickly to the norming or the surrender stage? So we, we know of situations, teams, churches, relationships, where this just goes on for years and years. And so is, is there any practical ways to move it from you know, this conflict into something more profitable? I think in this stage, it is really a tough stage to celebrate the diversity of giftings within the body. I think it's the stage at which we are wrestling with the challenges and the conflicts of diversity, um, but it's hard to celebrate. And yet, if God is the giver of those gifts, and if we're going to celebrate God and what he has done, even where we're facing challenge, I wonder if it's not, it's not important. I, I think of people who are facing adversity and still praise God. And I don't think that is living in falsehood. I don't think that is living a lie. It doesn't need to be. Uh, I think it is choosing to direct the focus at the giver of adversity. And I think here too we can look at the giver of the diversity and, and worship him and praise him and even uh, look for ways to honor each other even when we are so vastly different. Spending um, extra time, more time, in the forming stage probably pays off. Taking it slower, taking it longer, being more thorough is probably uh, very beneficial. But I think in the, in the storming stage, like learning to not fear the storm is important. A lot of us, probably all of us, really do hate conflict, really do not enjoy conflict. But conflict is actually a healthy part of relationships because there are differences. And just learning to embrace that there are differences and not to fear those conflicts uh, will actually help us walk through them more quickly, I think, because if we're, if we're fearing conflict, we're going to be avoiding conflict. And if we're avoiding those things that are causing conflict, uh, we're really not solving the problem. So spend the time up front, embrace the conflict, and uh, hopefully uh, you can move quickly through to, to a place of peace. Think about Jesus crossing the, the Sea of Galilee when you know, he's there sleeping in the boat. So they were doing ministry on, on one side of the sea, and they're like, hey, let's take this ministry to the other side. You know, let's go to the land of the Gadarenes there. And uh, no sooner do they get in the boat, you know, transplanting their ministry when there's a storm, and uh, Jesus is asleep. And they come to him saying, like, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? And the solution to the storm was Jesus speaking his peace into the storm. So I think for any storm that we're in, that's always the solution, is for Jesus to speak his peace into it. I just have a simple uh, practical solution that sometimes helps. And if you have a conflict to you're in the storming stage to write it down. Uh, when people put it on paper, sometimes it helps brings clarity to what the issue actually is, and then you can start to address that. So just a small practical thing that I found helpful. 
So writing it down, repeating it back to the person, is this what you're saying? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, asking clarifying questions to make sure you understand what it is that the problem is. Yeah. I used to live in the Midwest and in the state of Arkansas, and our elder bishop brother there was a great model for uh, bringing um, peace to conflict. And I always appreciated various things that I learned from him. I know that one time there was an element in the church that thought that the church was not on a good path, and they wanted to start another church of a different flavor. And he was like, well, sure. Uh, let us know where you want to go. We'll help, we'll help build your building. Uh, the last thing we want to do is work against the work of the Lord, and if we're doing it wrong, we might, end all, we, we might all end up over your church after a while. <laughs> and there was never a church division. It, that just took care of it right there. Uh, there could never be, they, they could never get enough of a consensus together to pull out and do this. How can you do that if your leader is saying he's going to help you build a building and might come to your church someday? So that was uh, one story from his life. I also remember him saying, or else his son, I forget, but they were saying that in a conflict, in a, in a conflict, in a relationship, the more spiritual person in the, in the conflict or in the relationship is going to need to lead the way in making peace. And so generally you think the person who needs to grow up should be the one you know, taking steps in, in uh, this, but actually needs to be the person who is more spiritual that takes the lead in this. And the example we have from the Bible on this would be the story of Abraham and Lot when there was uh, dissension, conflict, and there was strife between their employees. And Abraham says, well, here's the solution, and he led the way in that. And uh, so I've noticed people that have done that over the years, and they've always been a blessing to me. Okay, another question here from the audience. Uh, reaching the Amish, who already have the gospel. For a person who is in the Amish church, should he leave for a church that has more of an outreach mentality? Should he not be making disciples outside of Amish circles as well as staying Amish? What if evangelism outside Amish is not promoted? The church leadership discourages it. Should he stay and try to make a difference? I think of the Apostle Paul. He grew up within the Jewish culture, and the Jewish culture really actually held out the most critical part of Christianity and the very thing that he himself opposed until his Damascus experience. I find it so fascinating how Paul, the path out of the synagogues for Paul. It seemed like he didn't feel like just because they were on the wrong path that he should automatically leave his roots and um, take his new and liberated path. I, I find it fascinating how he would make actually his first stop, the synagogues, and he would be in the synagogues, but that wouldn't shut his mouth to the truth. And so he would, in the synagogue, speak the truth. And those who heard it were converted. Uh, frequently, eventually, he would be run out. And when he was run out, then obviously, uh, I think that put the burden on the Jews then. They couldn't say, ah, he, he wanted to leave us. And uh, instead, they would have to realize, we chased him out. Uh, I think that can often be the case. I wouldn't want to present that as the only way but I am inspired by Paul's ability to reach his own roots by uh, just continuing to say the truth in their uh, settings of worship until they sent him on his way. Uh, I don't want to, I know that's hard. I know that's terribly hard. And I'm not saying everybody needs to do that or should do that. That's just an example I see from Scripture that I think was probably one of the most powerful movements in causing his people to reconsider the path they were on. Obviously, that is probably a personal question.
question to someone here. And um, my thought is the counselor that you're, that's counseling you, if they're telling you to leave quickly, I would find another counselor um, because I agree with <laughs> what <laughs> Dwight <laughs> name went out the door. Um, just the wisdom of learning to to move slowly. I was involved with an Amish family that left the Amish several years back, and this was back when I was you know 20 years old, and I thought that was the way. And I learned a lot from that. It would not be my counsel to leave quickly anymore. Uh, to take your time, but yeah, get good counsel. There may be a place for it, but uh, do it do it slowly. Grow. You have lots of opportunity to grow your own character within that framework more than you realize. Yeah, not not, not a lot to add. I appreciate the answers of the brothers here, but. One thing in, in our own journey, the fellowship there, in coming out of a, a former setting and being where we are now, uh, one thing I learned from a brother there that he, he drove this point home hard, I would say, and that is don't trample on the faith of another. And, and he was referring to where we left, the home, the home setting. Like, like don't trample on the faith, faith that they do have. And, and I think that was really, really valuable. And I think that that would be true uh, even to someone within the Amish that's you know, leaving the Amish. Uh, even amongst the problems that exist there, there are people of faith. And they're probably being consistent. There's some being consistent to what they know and what they understand. Like, don't trample on that faith. So while it doesn't answer the question directly, I think, it is, I think it's wise, wise advice to someone in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree that this is a personal question. Uh, what, what answer for one person may be different from the answer for another. And I appreciate what you all said there about taking time to go do this. You may have read the story of, of um, St. Patrick, who wanted to be a missionary in Ireland. And uh, he was 50 years old before he finally got his church's permission to go to Ireland. And he would ask them periodically, and they would always tell him no. And between 50 years old and 80 years old is when he did his work. And some people, some historians say that there was no missionary who was more successful than the Apostle Paul than St. Patrick. And so by 50 years of preparation, he learned the language, he knew the language, but he kept working on it, he kept preparing because he knew that God was someday going to take him to Ireland, or he expected God would do that. And so he kept preparing for that until God finally opened the door, and then uh, he had been praying all those years, and he had the spiritual forces behind him as well uh, from God, and so had an effective work. So i just give that as an example. If, if a person leaves a setting before they've learned everything God wants them to learn in that setting, they will probably walk with a limp the rest of their life unless they can correct that in the next place that they go. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes a person uh, leaves and they're not ready to leave and they get to the next setting and then they learn the lesson and then they can grow and go on from there. So God has different ways of doing this. and. Uh, just encourage you to follow the Lord in that. And then as far as the uh, mission work, this question came up some years ago, I believe it was, it was an, an Anabaptist identity conference, and somebody asked this question, and, and one of the panelists said, um, if your bishop doesn't allow you to pass out martyr's mirrors at the bus stop, you tell him to come talk to me. <laughs> so sometimes we have to be a little creative in figuring out uh, how we can share the gospel in our settings in a way that uh, the church would be okay with it. Uh, so i just give that as an illustration. Anything else? All right, next question here from the audience. How important is it to realize that we are only conduit in which spirits flow? Are we prepared to work together if we don't understand this? How important is it to realize that we are only conduit in which spirits flow? Are we prepared to work together if we don't understand this? 
not sure if I get the full meaning of the question. If you think you do, go ahead. If whoever wrote this wants to give any further clarification or thoughts, go ahead. Uh, do we have another mic back here? Okay, we have another mic back here if somebody wants to comment on this. Okay, check, check. Basically, everything in our lives have a spiritual value, whether, whether for good or bad. And if we don't realize when we're in conflict with somebody, either, you know, the conflict can be, the, the, the devil can use even spiritual conflict to destroy us. I don't know, do I convey the message there or not? But okay. so many times we see people as objects. So because he's not doing something the way I think, he is not an object to me that I want to work out of my way, rather than recognizing the devil is actually using that to divide our relationship and work against the work of God. Mm -hmm. So do we realize that everything that we do in life has spiritual value, whether good or bad. That's my thought. Mm -hmm. Interesting thought. Anybody want to comment on that? So yes, there's a, there's a force of darkness and a force of goodness at work in all these relationships that we have, and I think that's a good point. Uh, there's, it's not just me and him. We don't wrestle against uh, flesh and blood. Uh, there is a spiritual component that's at work there as well, and especially if we're doing something that God wants us to do, uh, then the devil's going to be even more interested in trying to destroy that. So just knowing whether we're up against that element as well is uh, good to recognize when we get into uh, any kind of teams, whether it's teams within the church or starting a new church. Okay. Is there any questions from the audience here that you'd like to just give? We have a mic back here. Raise your hand, and uh, you can ask your question. Uh, up here in the front, in the meantime, you brothers can be thinking of your closing comments on relationships and teamwork. Yeah, so I have a question. So let's say someone has a burden or a vision, let's say for the country of Somalia, for example. And so they're like, I want to bring together a team to go and complete this vision, right? But as they're forming the team, they were kind of like the spearhead or the first person that birthed that vision. So how much authority, does that mean they have an extra level of authority over the rest of the team because they kind of were instrumental in forming the team? And how much should it be, especially let's say if they had years of prior missions experience, and how much is it we're all equals and um, how can we do this together? Okay, I think that's a good question. Let me see if I can summarize it. So you have somebody with a vision, somebody with experience, somebody that wants to make something happen. Um, how much should that person be in charge and leading out? And how much should it be, we're all equals on the same level until we appoint someone to be a leader, maybe? Is that right? Okay. I know lots of situations like this. It, it, is, it is a question of leadership. That is the, that is the question. And, and naturally, a person that's stepping forward with a vision is naturally a leader, right? So he's, he's putting forth his vision. Others are buying into it. But then you have others that come along and are like supporting, filling in the roles and that type of thing. 
And, um, and conflict can, can happen if, if the person, like the initial visionary, is not a great leader. Let's say on his leadership scale of one to five, let's say he's a two, and they pull somebody in that's a better leader, and they're a three or a four, um, it's going to cause conflict because the person that uh, the, the person coming in, joining the team, is actually a better leader than the than the ori original, and that has happened in church plant teams. That has happened over and over again. So it's it's a really really good question, and I'm not sure that I have the answer for it. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think that's something that is really difficult and often happens. Um, I, my mind goes back to the conflict of the original church planning team that Jesus put together and kind of happened on two fronts. First of all, it seemed like there were several who really felt they qualified to be at the helm next to Jesus in the leadership of this new frontier. And somehow it seemed like they got their mom in on it and their mom came to Jesus to work this out. What I find fascinating is the degree of frustration and anger this created in the other disciples, which suggests to me that they secretly were wishing for the same thing. Um, and it seemed like Jesus gave an answer that addressed everyone. It didn't just ad address the ones that took the initiative first to get that position, but also the ones who jealously reacted. And he gave them a purpose much bigger than being at the helm. And that was that ambition of being the servant of all. And I just don't know of anyone who argues with the person who is the servant of all. And I don't know if somehow in every kingdom endeavor, we can really believe and live that. <laughs> Maybe it helps with this challenge. One of the, one of the beauties of uh, the church is the tension between the visionaries and the builders. Um, for lack of a better term, I'm using the term builder. The visionary does plant a big picture, but the builder helps make it much better. And when the two can, can blend their uh, strong points, it is a thing of beauty, it's also a thing of tension. But it doesn't have to be an uncomfortable tension, it can actually be a, a good balancing factor. So, so in your hypothetical scenario there of you know, going to Somalia, um, we would hope that there'd be visionaries and builders within that team and they can learn to, to respect each other and, like Dwight said, serve each other. Many of us have uh, multiple qualities, multiple things we have to offer the kingdom. So there's, there's a variety of visionaries. You have some visionaries like Daniel Boone, who he's out there blazing a road through the Cumberland Gap and just tearing up the place and not wanting to spend more than one night at a camp, that kind of thing. Then you have other visionaries like uh, James Madison, who is spending four months in a hot, uh, stuffy room in uh, Philadelphia, drafting the U.S. Constitution and pulling people together. And two months into it, they still hadn't made any progress. And it was after two months of wrangling that they started making some progress. And at the end, uh, as I understand it, after four months, they had the U.S. Constitution as we know it today, and it passed by one vote. So there's different kinds of visionaries, and uh, some have leadership as you know their second quality. Uh, all visionaries are leaders, like they were saying, but some have administrative giftings in addition to visionary things. Others might not have that part. They might just be really good at uh, blasting holes through uh, mountains and things like that. And so um, <clears throat> sitting down together as a team and working with others who maybe know you. Uh, we've done that with a, a few teams already, sitting down, just talking about things, helping them understand each other, and um, 
trying to figure out some of these leadership questions. Um, often it's good if, if there's somebody appointed to be in charge at the beginning with an understanding that this may not continue forever. A couple years down the road, we'll look at this again and, and decide whether this person should stay there in the leadership position, the head leader, or whether somebody else should take up that role. Okay, thank you, that was a good question. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, my church has uh, done evangelism and we've had, oh, maybe four or five uh, guys that have um, been interested in the gospel and come for a little bit. And it seems like after not very long, they decide that they really don't want to deal with their sin as thoroughly as they need to, and they end up um, just walking away from it all. And so I was wondering what, or if we were, maybe weren't up front with them enough, uh, my congregation, or if, if that's uh, what, what uh, a good thing to address that is. First of all, I think that will happen, that people will decide not to. So I think there is an element of learning to be okay with that. But then I do think you're onto something of not being upfront with people. Like I think it's, it's important to present a, the gospel in a clear way of what the cost is, that the cost is high in order to be a disciple of Christ. and. There's, there's effective ways to do that and ineffective ways. And I, I think it's really important to learn the skill of what that effective way of communicating that to. And what I think that does then, it actually opens the door to attract people that are actually more open to that cost versus the other way around. So like, I think how we present the gospel actually decides the kind of people that's gonna show up at your door. So I th think, put some time into that. I think you're probably at a good place, but put some time into that quality. Mm -hmm. So if you ask uh, professing Christians in America what the gospel is, uh, the majority of them would probably say something along the lines of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and how that uh, affects us as humans. And if that's what you're helping people to grasp so that they can be saved, then uh, that's probably insufficient. I would look at the uh, gospel as being all of the New Testament. That's the good news. And so there's, I think, uh, somewhere around 800 commands in the New Testament uh, that we're told to do. And so you have to start with some and end up with others at the end. Uh, I understand that there's there's things that are weightier matters of the law and things that are less weighty, um, but it is good to be upfront. Our fellowship formed uh, five and a half years ago, and we had what we thought was some early success, bringing people in, baptizing them, and so forth, and only to have the majority of them, them turn away. Uh, very, very uh, disappointing in the time, but ultimately realizing that that God brought us those people to show us who we were. There's, uh, there's, I think there's an aspect in the early days we were very uh, self-centered. It was a lot about us, and God brought people to us who were just like that. And and ultimately, uh, God had to do some incredible breaking down in order to to put us in a place where we're healthy enough to disciple healthy people. And in a lot of ways, we're not even there yet. I think, I think uh, we haven't really come into that performing stage of ministry yet, though I think we're on the, the verge. I, I do believe and I do hope. But I'm not saying that, that that's the situation in your case, but um, it, it is something to, to think about. Who, who are the people we are attracting and why is it? And, uh, and ultimately, what can God teach us through those, through those things? A young man that I discipled and I baptized a year ago was arrested for attempted murder. 
And um, it's just, you know, that, that was probably one of the most sanctifying processes that I've ever walked through in my life. So. Okay, there's another one up here in the front, but he's gone. For a, a team to work well together, um, how often should they get together and how much time should they spend together um, and how often should they, um, how, to what level should they be involved in each other's lives? So I worked at a nonprofit discipling organization in Indiana for a couple years called Fresh Start. And there we had weekly staff meetings. Uh, we also had daily staff meetings with uh, the, the men that we worked with on a staff level. And then we had weekly staff meetings for men and ladies together. I look back on that as just being a really good thing. So it does depend somewhat on what kind of work you're involved in, but if you're involved in spiritual work, I, th I think you uh, want to have as many as possible. I know you can be meeting doubt and that kind of thing, and you can get together and pray if you don't have anything to talk about, but I, I look at that as being really important. I was interacting with someone who, from our church um, birthday, a church plan in the Bronx, and uh, that journey has been a really, really hard one. Uh, just got some uh, input from them this morning, and one of the really big pieces of advice uh, was that there's two words, a two-word sentence mentioned three times. It said, "Pray together, pray together, pray together." Uh, I think sometimes we rely so much on human strategy, whether it's what the larger Christian circle or the evangelical circle, the Protestant circle, or our own circle might uh, advocate. And there's certainly a, a, a really good place for that. But sometimes we do a lot of talk and very little praying. And it seems like praying does really bring uh, people together like no amount of talking can and um, right. so I think that device that was just given to me this morning from that church plant that is facing some huge challenges uh, of just advising that uh, a significant part of meeting together is praying together. Okay. Thank you for your attention. We're going to give uh, these three brothers a chance to make any final comments they want, and then I think the Kingdom Fellowship staff will be up here for announcements. My closing comment is this. The most effective leadership team in the world was the 12 apostles, and when they chose to put the first bishop in Jerusalem, they chose someone outside of their circle. If there are a number of uh, aspiring, starry-eyed church planters here, um, just know that uh, the journey is going to be a lot longer, it's going to be a lot harder, and there's going to be challenges that you can't even think of right now. But at the same time, I think the, the rewards are equally greater and the, the blessings more enjoyable than what, uh, what one expects. So. If it's something the Lord lays in your heart, God bless you, and uh, move forward with his grace. I think of the words that Jesus gave his own team um, about impacting the world. And he said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, by your love for one another. And perhaps the greatest impact that our team can make 
is in an interpersonal relationship of love. And they may hear that message louder than anything we say to them one-on-one. -on -one. And so uh, if we can hear the words of Jesus and, and realize how much maybe our primary message to those we're wanting to reach is a relationship of mutual love that may, I think Jesus was seeing that as that number one thing that's going to convince the world um, that we are his disciples and that they have something that is worth uh, receiving. Okay, thank you for your participation.